Thank you for coming to this overview presentation on the Common Core State Standards. I appreciate that you are here today to learn more about the work we are doing to support the standards and prepare Tulare County students for the challenges of the 21st century. The Common Core Standards have been a polarizing issue in the field of education for several years with a lot of misinformation shared by both supporters and opponents of the law. We have developed this information series to give you an overview of the standards and learn how TCOE is supporting schools throughout the region. In the past 20 years, technology has changed our schools in ways we've never imagined. Students now have the unparalleled access to information. The Common Core Standards were designed to address the way students apply this information, plus give them skills they will need to be successful in college and career. In short, we believe that the standards are necessary, improved, and yes, challenging. TCOE is fortunate to have a nationally known team of curriculum specialists who have been doing some groundbreaking work on applying the Common Core in schools. Under the leadership of Deputy Superintendent Dr. Guadalupe Solis and Assistant Superintendent Charlene Stringham, the team has developed tools that school districts across the nation have access. I would like to thank Charlene and the ERS staff for organizing this program. I would also like to thank you for making time today to learn more about our work in this important area of education. All right, so thank you for that. It was really nice that Mr. Vidak taped a message to all of us about why he sees it as being so important that we're here today. And so with that, we're gonna talk about ERS and our team overview. Um, so Educational Resource Services is part of the Instructional uh, Services Division here at TCOE. And so a little bit about our team. We have 24 consultants um, like myself that work in language arts, STEM, technology, various content areas. We have 11 support staff and eight library, library and multimedia staff. Um, our large part of our work are these two aspects here. So as a group, we provide over 150 professional development sessions for administrators and teachers throughout, throughout our county and beyond. We also do a lot of field work, which means that we're working within our school districts um, but much of our week. So we work with 57 districts and seven programs. The exciting thing about that is just this school year, um, our staff is providing 2,500 days of support, which equals 14 school years of support in just this one school year. So we're often out in the field working right alongside our districts, helping them to implement our new state standards. Uh, one of our large uh, aspects of our work is also supporting our other Tulare County Office of Education programs. So we work with new teacher leadership and development, the after school programs, early childhood, migrant education, and special education. In fact, one of my favorite things that I do every year is I work with the after school programs during our Choices week-long summer conference, and I present to the Choices staff about um, the shifts in mathematics and how they can support students in after school. This is really exciting to me because I started my education career in after school. So it's really great to get to work alongside people and tell them how, you know, this is where I started working and their roles are so important to our students. We're also excited because we have a new professional development um, offering called PBL Core. It's our project-based learning um, program that we are now offering um, to other counties and school districts that they can actually purchase our county program and then implement it in their schools and districts. Um, we also have a really awesome website, and the great thing is usually when I go around and talk to different schools, people will often say, oh, you guys are the ones with that website. And so this is a snapshot of what our website is. It's called Common Core Connect, and it has resources for teachers and administrators where they can find out about our professional development, other important events um, around our county and region, and also they can search for resources. Um, the really helpful thing is that if you're a teacher right now and you were to Google a standard, a Common Core State standard, you might get over 2 million results. I Googled a second grade standard and got 2 million results and then thought, how do you go through all of that and know what's a good resource and what's not? And teachers may not have the time to wade through all of that. 
So one of the things that we do is we work to identify as a team excellent resources and host them uh, links to them on our website. So if teachers were to search here, any results that they receive would actually be resources that one of our team of consultants has vetted and says, this is a great resource for Common Core and it's aligned to the standards. So we found that that's been a really great way for us to support our districts, um, both here in Tulare County and beyond. So what I'd like you to do is we know that there's been a lot of information um, about Common Core kind of out there. You might hear about it in your personal life. You might be wondering about it when you hear about it here at work. So I'd like you to talk to a partner or a small group. What is it that you're wondering about Common Core and what have you heard? And then I'll collect a couple of different responses from some different groups that are willing to share. Okay, so please just talk to the people around you. Oh, very defined line. Yeah. All right, I'm going to ask that you come back together. And what I'd like to do is see if maybe a few groups would share out. And um, just know that if you don't share out now, we also have a time for questions at the end. But hearing some of the things that you've heard or that you're wondering will kind of help um, guide our talk this morning. So are there any groups that are willing to share? Yes. Yeah. So I've, I've um, I'm just like anybody else. There's lots of articles online. And there's lots of opinions one way or the other. Some of the opinions that I've seen online and, and some of the responses back from teachers on those articles, those teachers who actually take the time to respond to people with the concerns, have been about implementation. That it's not so much Common Core that's an issue. It's how it's being implemented, particularly in certain states or by certain. Um, schools that perhaps the implementation process is being done poorly or without enough follow through. Um, so are you asking about um, if I've seen something like that? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, we had a great question in a session last week. We were doing one of these sessions as well and people said, well, how come there's so much variance? For instance, how come it looks like this here and it looks like this here? So exactly what Steve's talking about. Um, the implementation across different states or across even different district, uh, districts varies greatly. It's really there, each district gets to choose, these are their standards, but how they implement them, how they support and train their staff, that's all up to them. Um, so definitely a similar question was, you know, how come some teachers know all about the standards and other teachers feel frustrated and overwhelmed? And really that's going to vary based on the support they've received and um, the planning and other information that they have to go forward and implement. And that's a district by district basis. So that's a really good point that Steve is mentioning. And I would say that probably is the reality for a lot of our different schools or even our different parents. If you're a parent, your child might be having one experience and another friend's child might be having a different experience. I think you bring up a really valid point. Other um, ideas or sharing? Um, parents are struggling to help their students with that because mm -hmm. it looks so different. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I often talk about in my background is mathematics is I'll talk with parents a lot. I've been to um, parent-teacher organization nights, like a PTO or PTA night. Um, and so just like supporting our teachers, the way in which we support our parents is going to, right now, vary greatly, but I hope that over time that could be our next area of support. I would say even at our office we've talked about, so what next? So our Common Core Connect now has a community page, but we're finding the same thing. So now we've supported many teachers in districts, but the next step would be how do they support their parents. Um, I'll show a couple resources at the end of our session on Common Core Connect that might help parents as well, so we can begin to kind of move into that avenue. Yeah, for parents it's hard because I'll have many parents say, well, I didn't really like math, but then we're expecting them to get it the same way, be taught it the same way in school that we were. So I'm thinking, well, maybe if that was you and you didn't really like your experience, let's hope that this new experience then is better for them. But I do understand that they want to help their students and maybe we can support them in that way. Good. Anything else that you want to share before we move on? All right, feel free to ask questions throughout, but we'll also have a question time at the end. And I think that'll help kind of guide us, knowing that there is a lot of variance that exists with the support right now, both for parents, for teachers, and districts. All right, so to capture what Mr. Vidak said, I really appreciated how he helped us understand three reasons for Common Core, because people often ask, oh, so you're in education, what are your thoughts? 
I'm assuming you've probably gotten that a time or two. So it's really nice to be able to say, well, you know, we've talked about how they're necessary, they're improved, and they're challenging. So those are the three elements that we're going to talk about today. All right, so I'd like you to look at this picture for a second, and I'd like you to think, um, what do you notice about this picture? And just go ahead and shout out any things you notice. A laptop. Yeah. Huh, that doesn't seem like it goes there. What else do you notice? Rocket. A rocket. Camera. Camera. A camera. A camera. Good. What else? <coughs> what, do you see? what do you notice about the kids? The one on the right, what does he have? <laughs> he has like a virtual reality helmet. <laughs> Good. What do you notice about the students themselves? <laughs> they don't look very happy. Do they look like modern day students? No. So I asked you to look at this picture because I think it captures the quote very nicely. This quote is from John Dewey and it says, if we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's, we rob them of tomorrow. So I ask that you just picture right now what your school experience was like. And even if I think about what my grandmother's school experience was like and what the school experience is like for my children, we might see that not very much has changed, right? So now we have the same old kiddos and all these new tools, but most, for the most part, a lot of classrooms look the exact same way they did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And John Dewey was really insightful because uh, his quote is from the early uh, to mid 1900s. And um, that could apply very much today, just like he said it all those years ago. So today we're going to talk about how, how do we shift then? If education has stayed constant for so long, how do we make changes in education so our students will be better prepared? So one of the shifts that we're experiencing is the shift from um, knowledge as being what you know, the students who you might think of as the smartest in school were the ones that knew everything or remembered all those facts. Can you think of those people? And they just remembered everything. And so knowledge really then was what they knew, what, were in, what was in the books. To now the shift is it's not so much what you know, because if you don't know something, you can find it out very easily but rather it's your cognitive ability. What is it that you can do with what you know? So what caused this shift? If we're thinking about the classroom previously, our um, information was pretty much contained in those four walls. You had a textbook, an encyclopedia, a school library, and maybe a field trip to help you learn about your content. What's different now? The internet. The internet. So now students can access more knowledge than ever before with the click of a button. So now it's really shifting. It's not about what you know, because if you don't know it, you can just Google it, <laughs> right? You can find it, you can search for it. So now it's what can you do with all of the things that you know? And that's radically changing our classrooms. Okay, so as we consider then, the goal of our Common Core State Standards is that all students will be college and career ready. That's a really high, rigorous goal. In order to help them do this, we need to help them then use the internet to gather this information in a really um, supportive way. If we think about most of our students, they have lots of experiences with technology, but they're not coming to school knowing how to search or how to determine if what they find on the internet is credible or not. They're coming to school understanding that computers are fun, they can look up videos, they can use social media, but they don't really know the other aspects. They're not seeing the internet and technology as a tool, but rather a way to entertain themselves. So we have a lot of work to do in this area. We need to help students learn how to access the information appropriately. How do you find good quality resources? How do you run an advanced search? The number one um, tool that students use right now is YouTube. Well, that's not going to be as helpful for them when they're writing an essay or an argument piece. They really need to be able to use other search tools. So they need to be able to, have, to access the tools. Once they find the different resources, how do they analyze what's a quality resource and what is um, an, uh, an an, uh, a resource that is not credible? So they have to be able to analyze what they find to know if it's quality or not. And the difficult thing is there's no one on the internet saying these are good resources and these aren't. Students have to learn to decide. And sometimes what appeals to them doesn't have the most accurate information. 
They have to utilize what they find to be able to gather that information and then use it to create a product or a presentation or a paper. And oftentimes our students just think to use the information is to copy and paste it into their report. And so we have a lot of students that struggle with plagiarism or knowing how to use copyright and abide by copyright. So those are skills we have to teach them at work. And that's really important to their, or at school to help them with their future work. We also want students who can communicate. So now they've gathered all these resources, they put them together, but how do they communicate what they've found? They are going to need to communicate it through writing, perhaps through a presentation. And so in these areas, it's our role in education to support our students as they develop these skills. Because the way they use technology at home and the way we want them to use technology in school and in their future workplace is very different. Along with that, we have the 21st century skills which support college and career readiness. And so they're called the four C's. You can see them in our graphic here. So when we talk and when we think about um, perhaps as parents, what is it that we want for our students when they graduate high school? I always kind of laugh because usually parents don't say they hope their students can solve two-step linear equations when they graduate high school, right? Sure, they're gonna learn that in school, but that's not really what you hope for them. What you hope for your students is that they're problem solvers and communicators and successful in their career and in their life. And really that's where our four C's come into play. In school, how do we support students so that they can use critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration in everything that they do? Whether it's math, science, language arts, and so this is really a big shift for us because before it was school's about learning just all the stuff you learn, the facts, the dates, the formulas. And really, that's not enough. To prepare our students for the 21st century workplace, we have to prepare them with these skills. I won't read the quote to you, but it is from Daniel Pink, the author of Drive, and I just wanna highlight that he really says that there's a shift in what employers are looking for in the 21st century. And it's not just right brain skills, it's not just what you know, but rather the left brain skills, the creativity, and how you use what you know. So we've talked about why Common Core is necessary. Common Core is necessary in order to equip our students for a rapidly changing world. So now we're going to talk about why Common Core is improved. So if we had standards and now we have new standards, how are these better? So the history of Common Core began in 2009 with the CCSSO, the Council of Chief State School Officers, and the National Governors Association. These two groups collaborated to work on a series of new standards hoping that states would choose to adopt them to have um, a really nice collaborative across the states in the, new, in the United States. In 2010, California chose to adopt the standards. So um, sometimes I giggle when people say that the standards are new, right? It's 2015, our standards are like kindergartners. So they're not really that new, but the question that came up earlier was about the variants. The state allowed the school districts to take their own time and their own pathway to implementation. So some school districts are beginning their implementation this school year. Other school districts are in their third or fourth school year of using the new standards. So that may also account for some of the variants that Steve mentioned. So when California chose to adopt the standards in 2010, it replaced our previous standards that we had had since 1997 in language arts and math. And so I want to talk a little bit about the improvements. So in language arts, um, the Common Core State Standards actually look to the California ELA standards as a model, as a guide, um, because we always had very high standards in California. So you'll notice some elements from our old standards in our new standards. The thing that the new standards helped in language arts was there used to be some gaps or fragments. So for instance, you would see an idea appear in the standards in language arts and then disappear for three or four grade levels and then pop back up. So that doesn't happen anymore. The new standards in language arts are a really seamless continuum that flows from kindergarten through 12th grade. And so that's really helpful for teachers, but also for students. In math, we had <coughs> way too many standards and ideas per grade level. So you may have heard our math standards called um, a mile wide and inch deep. 
So we taught a whole lot in math before. We had rigorous standards because there was so much, but we didn't really go deep with very many items. And so students um, taught at the surface level would easily forget the things that they were taught so quickly and at a very shallow way. Um, a good example of this would be, consider how many phone numbers you used to know by heart before having a cell phone. Shout out, how many do you think you knew? Dozen. A dozen, a lot. Every, all of them, right? All the ones you had to know. How many do you know now? Two, three. <laughs> Two or three. So this is a really nice example of what was happening with our old math standards. There was so much, students would retain what they learned for short periods of time, like until the test next Friday. But after they didn't need to know it anymore, because they didn't get the depth, it would leave their memory. So students were forgetting things very easily. So the big shift in math is that now we have fewer topics, but concentrated on in a much greater depth. Okay, so I'm going to have you look at this profile. This is the ELA profile of a proficient uh, student in language arts, and I'd like you to skim through the bullets and pick one that stands out to you. As soon as you are done and the people around you seem to be done, please share which one you chose and why. Yeah, Let's so hear so from yeah, maybe two or three different groups. Which bullet did you pick? Which aspect of being a proficient English language arts student really stood out to you and why? Let's get maybe two or three groups to share. We, we as a group chose two. Um, we selected the use technological, technology and digital media strategically and capably because okay. they are exposed to more now. Mm -hmm. And um, we also selected um, they comprehend as well as critique. Mm, very nice. All right, so um, this group talked about technology and how they will use it more strategically, which I think we do recognize as a great need with our students. So they know how to get on the computer, they know how to download an app, but do they know how to do research on the computer? Do they know how to produce a short video that doesn't use copyright infringement, right? So there's some big issues there. They also talked then about comprehending as well as critiquing. Do they know how to do that in a way that is supportive of their classmates? Because when you hear critique, you might cringe a little, like, uh-oh, what does that mean? But do students know how to communicate with each other, to critique ideas, and do that in a collaborative, supportive way with their peers? Good. All right, let's hear from maybe one or two other groups. We also uh, are, a couple of people mentioned the technology aspect of it. Remembering that um, when we were in school, we didn't have email. Oh, yeah. yeah. That method of communication. Um, and then the other one that stood out um, is also understanding other perspectives and cultures and learning how to problem solve from different points of view. Yeah. So that students would value each other's perspectives will greatly help us as we critique others' ideas, but also that we understand other cultural perspectives as well. Very nice. All right, well, thank you for sharing and keep those in mind. But this is a much greater list than saying. Um, and you will be able to write complete sentences using proper punctuation. That's all still there. We're still teaching reading and writing and grammar, but look at how nice these goals are and what that would mean for our students if they all have these experiences. So I know you can't read that. <laughs> um, one of the nice things that we're talking about with the um, basically the flow or continuum with the language arts standards is the college and career readiness anchor standards. So what they did is they identified 32 skills that all students should be able to do as 12th graders and they backwards mapped them all the way to kindergarten. And that's how they got the college and career readiness anchor standards. I'll show you a couple of examples. And they're in these different areas. There are 10 reading, 10 writing, six speaking and listening, and six language. So what I want to do is kind of point out some of the things that you all talked about. So here, the second one that we're looking at, uh, writing anchor standard one, we can see that students have to write arguments to support the analysis of these topics. 
So that really actually draws upon what you shared about how important it is to critique others' reasoning. So students will have to do this when they write their arguments. They're going to have to critique the resources that they find. They're also going to have to make sure that they have sufficient evidence. So it's okay to have an opinion or a belief, but what evidence are students going to use to support that belief or opinion? And similarly here in the last one, it talks about, this is an anchor standard example for speaking and listening, and it talks about how students have to be prepared to efficiently participate in different types of conversations and collaborations. So this really draws upon what Olivia talked about with the cultural perspectives and backgrounds and valuing one another. So if we're going to be working with different people in the school setting, just like we do in the workplace, can we help equip students with the skills to collaborate successfully while valuing one another? So when we think about language arts, it's helpful to really see that uh, the new standards are shifted in three important ways. So the first big shift is to build knowledge. And when we talk about building knowledge, this is really talking about how students now in our new standards will be exposed to both literature and nonfiction text. This is really quite different than before because the emphasis was always on literature in the classroom and now we're seeing a balance with literature and nonfiction text and really an equal balance in the classroom. This really happens for a couple of reasons. The first is that what we found is after high school, the text that most of us all read during our work hours is nonfiction text. No one gets to come to work that I know of anyway and gets to read a mystery novel during the work day. Right? No one's asking you to read literature. We're all being asked to read nonfiction text. So this is greater preparing us and our students for the workplace. But another great um, effect that I've seen from this is my two older boys are in school and I've noticed that they've become more engaged in reading as there's been more nonfiction text in the classroom. This is something that I never realized before as a student or teacher myself because I loved literature. But what I found with my boys is they were much more interested in nonfiction texts than literature stories. And so by now having this balance in the classroom, they've really been invigorated as readers and much more engaged in some of the content. They would much rather read about their sports heroes or sharks <laughs> than one of my childhood favorites, Stuart Little. So I had to let it go. We never finished Stuart Little. <laughs> uh, but that's just a really nice example that it's valuing all learners. So not only is it important for after high school, it's also important because not all students like to read the same thing. The second um, instructional shift is to extract and employ evidence. So you may notice this theme of evidence and that students are going to continually be asked, if I share an opinion, you could easily say, what's your evidence for that? Okay, and evidence can be used both from literature and nonfiction because you go back to the text and actually cite, this is where um, I thought about this inference. Okay? And then the last one is engage with complex text. This is important because it was also found that after high school, the uh, level of text to which um, employees read is much higher than the level of text students were reading in school. So because of that, you will see that in all the grade levels, the reading levels have been increased with our new standards. This is to prepare students to be more ready after high school for the literature and the nonfiction that they'll read. Um, similarly, in class, teachers are working. Um, students will often read at their own grade, uh, at their own reading level. For instance, if you're a fifth grader reading at a second grade level, you'll have lots of experiences reading second grade material because you're a struggling reader. But what was happening is students weren't having enough on grade level experiences. So students will also be provided with the support of the teacher opportunities to engage with complex text, both for struggling readers and on grade level readers. What does that look like? With the support of the teacher, we're going to closely read information um, using strategies so that all students can access this complex text. Otherwise, our struggling readers were just reading at their own level and they were never accessing the on-grade level uh, material. Okay? Um, yeah. What does closely read mean? Good I see question. That term. Yeah, so closely read. To closely read, a great example that we give is our ELA um, consultants will often say, there's not much that adults have to closely read. And I'll always giggle and say, oh, what about 
you know, loan documents or um, insurance forms or in math, the progressions that we provide our teachers. Close reading as an adult, you could feel this anytime you read something, you're not sure what it means and you have to reread it. Or you highlight or underline to really make sure you understand something and you may even have to look up a word. So close reading is a process of multiple reads that helps our students better understand the text. And for adults, we still have to closely read some things. But the novel you're reading on the weekend probably isn't requiring you to close read. That's reading for engagement. So we want to make sure our students have these opportunities where they read articles or other texts that really take some teacher support to help me understand them. We're going to read it, we're going to discuss it with our peers, we're going to reread it. We might look at a word that we're not sure about in the fourth grade and discuss its meaning as a class and then go back and read that passage to see if we understand better. So it's a process of reading to help support our understanding of the text. It's a great question. The nice thing is we can actually close read in other subject areas too. So it's more a strategy for reading and comprehending than just, it just happens. Okay, in math, we want our students to closely read when we're looking at word problems or tasks because they often jump to solving without making sense of the problem first. All right, um, the last thing here before we leave here is it's really great that this multi-state collaboration with our Common Core State Standards, um, now there are so many resources. Before with our old standards as a teacher, if I were to search for something on the internet, I might find a handful of resources. Whereas if I search for something now, I find so many different resources. I actually have the opposite problem. Which ones are good and which ones aren't. All right, and so moving forward, we're gonna shift gears from language arts to mathematics for a little bit. And we also in math have a profile of a proficient math student. They're called the eight standards for mathematical practice. <laughs> so coming back together, <laughs> There were some really nice conversations around the room about what do, what do these mean? And I always thought math was like this, and this sounds a little bit different. So can I get a couple of groups that might share out which math practice stood out the most to you and why? Yes. We both agreed on the first one. We thought that was really important, and it ties in with learning you know, uh, all the different ways mm -hmm. to solve a particular type of problem. Mm -hmm. um, some, I know, and I've, I've read that some parents have issues with, you know, how many ways to learn how to multiply multiple digit numbers and so forth. Why do they have to learn all these different ways? By learning all those possible avenues of doing so, that helps you be able to persevere a little bit longer because you haven't utilized every single tool in your, your tool belt, so to speak. If one way of working doesn't work and you know three or four other ways you could do this, one of those may may work for you. So it's nice to have that um, by doing that, seeing a skill that ultimately does work, it leads you to go farther in math than you might normally go without those skill sets. Definitely. So with the first one, make sense of problems and persevere in solving them, having multiple strategies actually allows you to get unstuck. If we only know one way, like Steve was talking, if we hit a roadblock, well, we're done. But it, what Steve was talking about, if we know other ways, we can backtrack, we can choose another direction, we can apply a different strategy. So that allows us to go further in math. And this overall develops a much deeper understanding of mathematics than um, we had been aiming towards previously. Also, one thing Steve mentioned was all the different strategies, say for multiplication. So one thing that parents and teachers should know is that the standard algorithm, the standard computational way that we've done most procedures, are delayed in the standards about one full grade level, um, later than where we think they would normally happen. This is so that students would understand the concept first and learn the steps second. Because if you forget the steps, then you can fall back on the concept. But the other way around doesn't work. If you only learn the steps and you've forgotten them, there's no concept for students to utilize to help them get back on track. Really nice example. Okay, others, were there other math practices that stood out to you? Well, we also said uh, use appropriate tools strategically, and that kind of covers what Steve was talking about too, how you can use different uh, strategies to tackle the problem. Not necessarily just a calculator, mm -hmm. but strategies as well. Great. 
So tools include tools like a calculator, technology tools. There are many online math tools that students are now working with, but also, like you mentioned, those strategy tools. That's really important, and you might see a nice overlap there between the math tools and how we use technology efficiently. So the same kind of thing. Do students know when and how to use a calculator? Do students know when and how to gather math information on the computer? Or what software, perhaps, would best represent um, the equation they're trying to grasp? Nice. Any others? All right. So moving forward um, to talk about math, this is just the structure of the math standards, kindergarten through high school. I won't go into it too deep, but I do want to talk about a little bit how we talked about how in language arts it's a nice coherent flow from kindergarten to 12th grade. You'll actually see the standards spiral in language arts through each grade, grade level where they'll take similar ideas and go deeper each year. That didn't actually work as well with math. That's how our old standards were. Um, kind of in your mind, if you can picture like a slinky, right, and you'd revisit the concepts each grade level, that didn't work as well in math. So math is structured a bit differently. You can see these blocks of information. So the way that I like to explain the math standards is more like Legos. So the idea being that students will get their math Legos and build them onto their foundation. And they don't spiral back, but rather they build on top of one another going deeper into the content. So that's a little bit different. Okay, different than ELA and different than our old math standards, but it actually helps student understanding to really grow and develop. Um, a nice in, uh, example of this would be with fractions. When you say the word fractions, usually uh, students, teachers, and parents alike kind of all get a little anxious feeling. Fractions tend to be one of the most uh, difficult areas for students. In our old standards, fractions started very young. First grade students were already writing and comparing fractions, but starting so young didn't seem to help. Their fraction knowledge was the most fragile probably of all the math concepts. So you'll see now that the fraction Legos are really built in third through fifth grade. Those building blocks are really built in a very deep and comprehensive way, so students will really understand fractions instead of getting a little bit at a time, confusing students more than helping them. Okay, so that's a really big shift, and that's why we have that picture there. So math is really like big building blocks. In math, there are also three instructional shifts, just like in language arts, and the first one is focus. So the authors of the standards really ask teachers to focus where the standards focus. This is a really important idea because they talk about several ways that we actually detract from focus. So teachers, we sometimes inadvertently detract from focus. We have our favorite unit ever on fractions and we're a second grade teacher and we still want to do it even though fractions move to third grade. So sometimes we accidentally divert from the focus of the standards and take time teaching something that is not a current standard. But another way that we detract from the focus is that sometimes our textbooks detract from the focus. I'll often ask teachers, have you ever met a perfect textbook? What do you think they say? No, and I don't think we will. Um, for quite a while, if ever, right? So sometimes we are using our textbook and we're like, but it's in the book, so I have to teach it. If it's not the standard, then we're not going to teach it. So teachers must develop a very critical lens <coughs> as they're looking at their materials. If it's on the standard, I'm going to teach that lesson. But if it's not on the standard, I'm going to let that one go and give this lesson more time. The number one challenge that I hear from teachers is time. They need more time to teach what they're teaching. They need more time to develop the ideas. So focus, if we really um, have a really great desire to achieve focus, that'll help us with some of our time issues. It means we're not going to teach all the lessons. We're going to teach the ones that are on standard. We're going to give extra time to those. So in addition to focus, we have coherence. So one of the big ideas is that in math, most of you probably think of math as a bunch of segmented pieces. Right, like graphs are over here, and algebra is over here, and geometry lives over there, right? But with the new standards, we really want a much more um, cohesive view of mathematics, that all of these areas support one another, and they all make up math. Not as individual pieces, but as a really nice um, interrelated concepts. For instance, um, with graphing and data, for instance, bar graphs, they usually always live in their own chapter. 
The vision for our new standards was actually that they would live with addition and subtraction. The reason for that would be that as students are learning to add and subtract, they would solve problems about the graph using addition and subtraction. For instance, if you took a class vote, you could then ask questions like, how many more students preferred soccer than baseball in our class? Now the data is living with the addition and subtraction in the same area, helping students to see how math is interrelated. That's very different from how we taught it in the past. So within the grade levels, the math is related, but also across grade levels. So if I'm a fourth grade teacher, it's very important that I understand what the third grade teacher did with fractions, what I'm going to do with fractions, and how fifth grade is going to build upon that. Because the standards are such that they're very much like building blocks, every grade level's role is really important in how it connects to the other grade levels. Lastly, we're going to talk about rigor in mathematics, and in our state, we always had very rigorous math standards. They were very high, and there were a lot of them, and primarily rigor before um, existed really in this one way, procedural skill and fluency. So if you remember your math of the past, really focusing on steps, right, and speed, that's more of an element of the past. Um, standards and it's still important, but it's only one of three equally important areas of rigor. Now we're also looking for rigor in conceptual understanding. It's not enough for students just to do the steps. They also have to understand why we're doing the things we're doing. And also application. Many times students ask, why are we learning this? Why would I ever have to know? So a large focus of the new standards is application. So to be rigorous mathematics, you have to understand why it works, how to do it, and where it's used in the real world. The application is, why do we do this math? Where does it happen in real life? And at every grade level, where it, whether it's second grade or seventh grade, what does this math we're learning look like in the real world? Okay, really giving a purpose and a relevance to the math students are doing. All right, so look at this picture for a second. It always makes me smile. And what do you notice the students doing? They're using technology. This is great. They're using technology. And they all appear to be in educational settings. They're using technology in the classroom. Um, I giggle because while I was still in the classroom, I had one computer that one person used. And that person was me, the teacher. This is a picture of what we should see in classrooms. We should see students using technology to learn. But really, even though computers have been around for a long time, since the green screen, right, computers, to now, very little classroom or technology use has been able to happen inside the classrooms. So a positive that I've seen from the, our new assessments for the state that are computerized has been, I actually see kids in classrooms using computers, right? So that's been really great. And because schools have been pushing to get technology to test their students, you're now seeing opportunities for students to use technology throughout the entire school year. And so you saw the main point. The students have to use the technology. They can't watch the teacher use technology. Additionally, sometimes we talk about that um, there's this disconnect between learning with technology and learning the technology. So we don't send our students to school to learn pencil. We're also not going to send them to school to learn computer. They need to learn with a computer, the technology is embedded. And so there are some, um, you know, there's some struggles with that. Well, how do I teach them to do this on the computer if they don't know how to type? So typing is probably the one that I hear most often. And we really want to balance typing practice with using typing to learn or typing to make a presentation because we can do typing practice every day and there's no application there. Or we could do it for small, small little experiences and really ask them to create a PowerPoint. The more students use technology, what's gonna happen with their typing skills? The better they're going to get. But if they're just doing practice, like time typing practice, it's not as engaging for the students and there's no real application. So we are asking teachers to consider how much computer practice do you have and how much learning with the computer do you have. And that's really our goal, that technology is embedded and those skills will come over time. Yeah. So you're solving, you don't want 
open to learn how to use this keyboard? That's a good you question. Would, you would rather than <coughs> just teach instead of starting with the basics? That's a really good question. We want them to do both, but you have to be careful of an overemphasis of just the basic typing skills like the home row and such. Because if you consider all the people in the room, we probably all don't type perfectly, right? Um, for instance, I don't even know what the home row is. Like I know it exists, right? Because I was a student between the typewriter and the computer, so I never had a typing class. Is that hindering my ability to do work on a computer? Not really. So we just want to be careful of the overemphasis because students use technology so much, we want them to learn it through using it. Does that mean they never get basic skills? No, but just vary that. We don't want them to have an hour in basic skills every day. One, the teachers don't have time, and two, it's not as engaging. So we'd like a balance of both, just not an overemphasis on basic skills. It's a really good question. I see you have another one. Go ahead. No, it's okay. 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 It's just I, I don't agree. I think that they, in order for them to be working for everything that you're asking of these kids to be critical thinkers and to critique what they're saying and to type their papers, they're going to need that. And I, yes, I came from, I had a class and it was rigorous like that where I learned the keyboard and I learned it on a typewriter and it really benefited me. Whereas my colleague, me and her, she didn't learn it like that and she's still typing it like this. And so we're trying to put presentations together and um, show teachers, you know, put yeah. um, our PowerPoints together to teach teachers and it's it's hard on her because she's still typing like this, sending me an email and I'm my email got sent a long time ago. Hmm. Yeah, and it is true, there is a balance, but just not an overemphasis on the basic skills. You do need both. So you will there they will teach them the basics, they will teach them the homework, because that actually really helps. I think they will, but it's just not an overemphasis of that. So we don't need so much of that every day. Also, computer skills are supposed to start in kindergarten, so over time they're getting all of these, whereas like when I was in school, the kids who did have that class, it was like one year freshman year. So that's very different from our experience, because kindergartners will work on the computers, and first graders, and second graders. Steve, you also had something to add? Yeah, for me, back in high school, the, the example that's similar in nature is I took a typing class, mm -hmm. and it made me a very proficient typer. I also took a business call course, and that made me proficient at typing business correspondence. But it never really coalesced until I took a class in college that finally required that I type using a, a keyboard my thoughts about a piece of literature. At that point, I was finally using those keyboarding skills was something I actually cared about because I could never quite get into business correspondence. Right. But having something I cared about drove me to really type, type, type as fast as I, because I wanted to type as fast as I was thinking yeah. um, to get the thoughts down. And I think that's, I think that's where you're going with it. Is the, the kids need the typing practice, but they really need to type something that they're passionate about to drive them to excel at the writing skill. Right, to make them want to use the computer. Those are excellent examples. And I think we're really all talking about the same thing. But for our kids, it's going to be quite a bit different than it was even for us because Steve's experiences were high school and college. We want these experiences to start when they're five and six. So yeah, this is exciting. So that's the idea that technology is embedded. And so now we've talked about how Common Core, our new state standards, are really improved. They're improved because they draw on the research for uh, educational best practices, how students learn content, and so they've really been improved quite a bit over our previous standards. And now as we move forward, we want to talk about why our new state standards are challenging. Because you will hear a lot about the challenges. Challenges in lack of technology, or time, or resources. These all account for the great variance that we talked about earlier. So there are a lot of challenges as schools transition. So one of the first challenges is a challenge in assessment. So now we've talked about how what they're learning is new. And so in addition to them learning new things, we're also going to assess them in new ways. Um, but assessment is not new, and standardized assessment is not new. So sometimes people worry like, oh no, these new standards and these new high stakes tests. That's not anything new for our educational system in our state, but also across other states. So we're continuing to test students, but with our new technology, we actually are able to test them in ways that we've never been able to before. 
So I'll draw your attention to CASP, the first acronym at the top. I just want to share with you that that's basically our umbrella of assessment systems here in our state. So underneath the CASP umbrella, the California Assessment System, we have assessments for science, um, English language development, and we have our Smarter Balanced Assessment. So you'll probably hear about both. So CASP is our umbrella, all the assessments in the state, and Smarter Balanced is our assessment specifically for our new language arts and math standards, okay? And so as we look at that then, you can see that the changes in assessment also reflect the changes in education over the past years. So in the 1970s and 80s, the goal really was minimum competency. So that was the goal, that all students left high school with a minimum competency. In the 90s and 2000s, the uh, bar was raised essentially, and now the goal was proficiency across content area. Now with our new standards, once again, we're seeing that we're increasing the rigor and the goals for all of our students uh, with the goal of college and career readiness. So it's just a really nice visual example to show how our educational system is really working toward continual growth. And we have been able to do that both as a state and as a nation. Our students are growing, our education system is improving, and this is a nice example of how that has gone across the decades. Okay, so I want you to look at this example. This is a very traditional multiple choice math example. And as you look at it, think about if you were the teacher and you had a student choose A, what would you know about the student? Maybe they didn't read the question. Maybe they didn't read the question. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't understand fractions because is A the correct answer? No, but I really don't know what's going on in the student's mind except for that some reason or another, they got the wrong answer. So as you're looking at this example, what if the student chose C? What might we think? They guessed, we might think they guessed. We might think they got the right answer. We might think their teacher told them when in doubt. Yeah. Choose C. In this case, C happens to be the right answer. <clears throat> but will this problem give us as teachers any information about what they're really thinking? Not really. And so this is a nice example of an old assessment item that covers one standard and one question. I'd like us to look, and it's not that these types of questions aren't important, but unless the student does some work or we have some conversations, I really don't know if they did eeny, meeny, miny, mo, or they have fraction solid, okay? So let's look at a similar question. This is an SVAC example, and it's specifically for communicating reasoning in mathematics. Liam is making lemonade. He needs 16 ounces of lemon juice. He has 10 lemons. Each lemon makes about an ounce and a half of juice. Will he have enough juice? Explain how you know. Please talk with your partners and what are your ideas about this problem? Does Liam have enough juice? How would you do this if it were the real world? Have those conversations, please. All right, so um, I've heard a lot of conversations around the room and even um, hearing how different this is than the kind of questions we were asked. Mostly we were probably asked questions like that. There will still be questions like that on our new assessments for math, but I wanted to highlight this question today because it's specifically assessing how well do students not only do the math, but how well do they communicate their thinking. So you'll notice that this question covers two standards, one mathematical practice, and it's still just one question. So it's quite a bit different than in the past. So did anyone talk about um, how you might uh, communicate your reasoning about this problem? What were some ideas? Do we have enough juice? No. Why not? You could not? solve the problem so that you could answer the question. So you still will know if the student is able to answer the question, but now you'll know why it's hard for them to answer it or why they can't answer it because you want them to explain how you know if there's enough juice. 
Exactly. So they're still doing the math that they did in the previous problem, but now they're explaining it and relating it to the real world, really applying it to the real world. So one thing that we also want to highlight is that if you say that there's 15 ounces of juice and no way that's not enough, that's a full credit complete answer, right? There's not enough because you said I need 16 ounces. However, if a student also says, there's 15 ounces, but I decided to add a little bit of water, so I think we're close enough, as long as they still got 15, the answer is 15, the way in which they defend their answer can vary. So that is really real life, right? Because how many people would just say, oh, I'm a little short, water. <laughs> Um, I saw a student example and a student said, if I happen to get a little bit larger lemons while I'm at the store, then I might get a little more <laughs> than an ounce and a half. So I think that it'll be enough because I only um, need 16 ounces and my calculations show 15 ounces. But this is really the real world type of math that we do every day and it's a nice bridge between the procedure and the application. Or more sugar, <laughs> yes, exactly. And then that waterline rises a little bit. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to show you a similar example, but in language arts, and it's just coincidence that we chose both lemon problems. <laughs> so both subject areas have two assessments. So at the end of the year, they have two assessments, a computer adaptive test and a performance test. So the lemons we looked at previously would be part of the computer adaptive test, but a response where they have to type in some information. This is part of the larger performance task that all students will take in language arts and math. This is an example of fifth grade language arts where students are gonna learn about philanthropy. I know that many fifth graders won't know anything about philanthropy, and that's okay. With every performance task, teachers are provided a classroom activity that they do within a week of giving the assessment, both in math and language arts, to build background knowledge. That way, all students have equal access to the task. The teacher won't know what the actual test prompt is, this would be an actual test prompt, but rather they would be given information like, have a class discussion about this video showing children raising money for um, say, Children's Hospital, something like that. So they would have experiences and discussion prompts to help build background knowledge. Then when they take their assessment, they'll see how what they learned and did in class will now support their work on this task. None of the work from the classroom conversation carries over into the test and it's not scored. It's just so that all students have the same opportunity to access this task. Right? Otherwise, we know that many of our students would have a disadvantage. Even when I looked at that, I'm like, children that are philanthropists. I, didn't, I couldn't think of any examples that I even knew about children who were philanthropists. So we're seeing how in order to make it so that all students have the fair access to the assessment, there has to be that pre-work, okay? So then students come into the class on their assessment day and they watch a video about childhood philanthropy, and then they read three informational texts also about philanthropy. Then from there, they're going to compose a full-length opinion essay citing evidence from the articles and the video they watched. So they have all the resources from which to write their essay. And this is a fifth grade example. So you can definitely see the increased rigor. This would be something more that we might have thought that we would do, oh, we'll do that in high school will use and draw uh, evidence from text. But students are really starting that as low as kindergarten, and this is a great example in fifth grade. Similarly, a fifth grade assessment is now, because of the technology, we can assess in ways we haven't been able to previously. This is an audio clip about the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So students will listen to the audio clip and they can take notes. There's a notes feature on the assessment. After listening and taking notes, they're going to answer some questions about what they heard. So we've often had questions like that in the past where they read and respond. Now this is a listen and respond. After listening, the students will click, did the cathedral bells cause leaning or fix leaning? Did the steel cause leaning or fix leaning? So the technology really allows us to assess in um, very different ways than we have previously. But that doesn't mean there won't be any more multiple choice. Multiple choice is still a component of both the math and language arts assessments. Question? Would they get to um, 
replay that audio file? Yes, they will get to listen to the audio file multiple times, at least twice, but I don't know if there's an upper limit. Like, you can only listen to it seven times. I'm not sure about that. All right, so that's a nice example of language arts. And what I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to talk in your little group. Um, today, we started off by identifying the four C's, collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking as a focus for the 21st century. I'd like you and your group to talk about at least one example where you've seen us uh, use the four C's today. Yeah. And let's see if we can share two examples of the four C's throughout our morning together. Well, we, we saw creativity and critical thinking throughout on all of them on the lemons, and, and it wasn't necessarily explicit. Uh -huh. um, on the lemons example, because you were giving the number of facts or factors to the problem, you were not only given 10, one and a half and 16, and it leads a student to want to estimate in their head immediately before they even go answering, is this enough? I think it's about enough. But they still have to go through and solve the problem. On Alex's lemonade stand, it's implied through going through the exercises that you as a student can make a difference in the world, can have an impact. It, it draws you in through creativity and critical thinking, um, almost secondarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and then lastly, on the Leaning Tower of Pisa, it applies through the problem that major complex problems can be solved through thinking and collaboration. The piece supports that, reinforce the foundation. They're implied things that in addition to having to solve the problem, are kind of nice messages to give a student while they're going through the assessment in the first place. Very nice. I like how you kind of said that they were all inherent and they weren't kind of like, okay, now you're gonna critically think, right? Yeah. They happen as part of the process and so these tasks and assessments have been designed to really elicit that from our students to give them those opportunities. If we have all problems like that first math one, it didn't really elicit any of those types of responses. So these other tasks and learning experiences are designed as such to encourage students to critically think and be creative. Really nice. Any other examples? Well, thank you. I think you um, probably have seen quite a shift in the way we're looking at information, the way we're asking students to share information they've learned. And I think it's really exciting anyone think you would have enjoyed learning in this way? Yeah, the Leaning Tower Pisa one really caught my interest because I didn't much enjoy history as a student, and I'm like, wow, that's so cool, right? Yeah, really neat. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about assessments before we wrap up this segment. And so when we're talking about the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, our language arts and math test, there are practice tests. So with all these changes, oftentimes people are afraid of what the unknown is, but a really great benefit of our new assessment system is that we currently have more information about the new test at the very first year of giving them than we ever had about the CST. We have practice tests for all the testing grade levels and the computer adaptive test and the performance test. We have sample items. All of those things eventually, we got some of those for the CST after years and years of having it. At the onset of our new test, we now have more resources for teachers and parents than ever before. In fact, I sat with my fourth grader the Sunday evening before he started his testing, and we did the math practice test together, just sitting on the couch and having a conversation and looking at the assessment. The California Department of Education last year crafted letters asking parents to do just that but then it was up to the districts if they sent those letters out. But I found the activity to be really rewarding because now we could have a conversation about, okay, so how do you think it went? We also talked about the fact that the tests are computer adaptive, which means that they're going to change based on how we respond to the questions. So in a nice way to explain to a fourth grader, I said, what's going to happen is if you're struggling on the test, you're going to notice that the problems are going to get easier. I said, that needs to tell you that you need to slow down and start using your scratch paper more. And then I said, and if the problems get harder and harder, that should tell you, don't get worried, that should actually tell you you're doing a pretty good job. They're trying to increase the level of the problem to see where you're really at. But in a nice way, making sure our students understand how the assessments work. 
He came home and told me the last two problems were so hard they took 25 minutes. <laughs> we don't know yet what that means, but we'll get his scores in August. But at least we have this ongoing communication and I can be an involved parent during this time of a lot of transition if I know what tools are available. All right, and so a really big important idea as tests are completing and scores start to come out this fall is that we have new standards, new tests, and new scores. There's no such thing as lower scores because we've never had these scores before. So we have, cannot compare star scores to SBAC scores. As they say, that's like comparing apples and oranges. They're two totally different things. It's actually against education code to do so. So you're not going to see districts comparing, you're not going to see county offices comparing, but what we know might happen is people might compare to themselves, right? So if you have some friends who are um, really enjoy posting every August the perfect scores that their students get on the CST, perhaps on Facebook, this is the type of conversation we might want to have with our friends. They're going to get their kids' scores back and say, but they used to be proficient and now they're a level two. And they're going to think they're doing worse or their school's not doing as well. But really, our message needs to be, these are new tests and new standards. That's a new starting point. And how we communicate that to friends and even our own children really matters. Right? I don't want my kids to think they did something wrong or they didn't do a good job. It will be a conversation like, wow, this is your first score on your first new Smarter Balance test. I wonder what it will look like next year. What did you think about taking the test on the computer? and then moving on from there. But our natural inclination for many people is to say, but they were here and now they're here. So how do we help support friends and colleagues and even our own children when we get our scores back? There are challenges in instruction and I really love this image for this portion because it's not that we're gonna change all the things we used to do, but rather we're gonna build upon successful classroom strategies to help more students become successful and also to reach the high um, goals that we have set for our students and our schools. So we're gonna keep what we have and we're gonna build upon it. That's really exciting. But for most teachers, there's really been one primary mode of instruction, kind of like what I'm doing right now. I tell and you listen. With our new state standards, our state is acknowledging that there are many, many modes of instruction. This isn't the only one. It might not be the best one, but it depends on the content. What I'm teaching and when I'm teaching it is going to also play into how am I going to teach that, right? So it's not all stand and deliver, <laughs> but today it mostly is. As we consider then shifting modes of instruction, we want to look at rigor and relevance. How do we bring the learning that the students are having, how do we connect it to their lives? And rigor and relevance is one framework for doing that. I think this is best illustrated through an example. So much of the learning that we had in schools was a lot of quadrant A learning. For example, identify the nations in World War II, right? Now, that is a low application, low rigor. It's like, just give me a list and I might forget it by next week. But I learned something. Uh, a higher application, but not necessarily very rigorous, but still very interesting, would be to interview World War II veterans and get their perspectives on the war. That would be very uh, high interest, right, and very engaging because it's high application, high relevance. Quadrant D is really where we want to get a lot of instruction to Quadrant D so that it's both high application and high rigor. That uh, example is summarize the global impacts of World War II and project the impacts of the Iraq War. So now we're using what we learned about one war to now make predictions about what the impacts of another will be. So that's high rigor, high relevance. Over here we have high rigor but not as much relevance. Analyze original documents from the war and summarize the U.S.'s opposition to entering World War II. So very rigorous going through all those original documents, but not as much application. What we really want to see in the classroom is elements of all of these quadrants, because you can see that these are all interesting lessons, and together they would really develop a deep understanding. We also want to aim for more activities that meet quadrant D. 
because for too long, most, most, much of our learning has lived in quadrant A. Another way to achieve this type of learning is through project-based learning, and I talked earlier about our PBL core, and here you'll see the elements of project-based learning. And one thing you might notice is a really high emphasis on real-world connections and also an authentic audience, just to name two of the elements. Those elements take what we might think of as projects in the past and really make them real-world applicable activities for students. For instance, they might design a school garden that their school actually wants to build. They'll do the math and all the calculations as well as the design planning. Then they'll present their final plans to uh, maybe a panel of uh, landscape architects in the area and get feedback about their plans. Um, and so that's a very different approach to learning where the students drive some of that learning, have questions they want to answer, and also have interdisciplinary components. We have a great video on that that you can get at our website from the postcards that you picked up as well on the PBL link page. So as we come to a close, we want to talk about our goal. Our goal here that we discussed for our standards was college and career readiness. So how are we supporting that at the high school level? So this is an example of Visalia Unified's Link Learning Academies, and the academies provide experiences for high school students while in high school to connect um, their learning in class to real world work experiences and to a particular field of interest. And this way they're going to further develop their interests um, before going to college. So sometimes people get worried, what if they do an academy and they go to college and they don't want to do that anymore? That's okay. They actually are a more well-rounded candidate entering college anyway for the experiences they've had, even if they were interested in agricultural science in high school and decided to go into the medical profession in college. This just offers a unique opportunity for our high school students. Additionally, each high school in our Linked Learning Consortium in Tulare King County has created a list of graduate outcomes. I'd like you to look at the outcomes and find any overlap between these outcomes and our profiles of proficient students for language arts and math. When you find one, just shout it out. Critical thinking and problem solving skills. Critical thinking and problem solving skills. Good. Cultural awareness. Critical thinking. What else? Communication, we saw that in language arts and we saw that in math. Any other? Creativity. I think this is really exciting. I would love for all of our students to graduate meeting these outcomes and you can see how our standards expectations for math and ELA nicely support these end goals for all high school students. This is just an example from Porterville Unified, but like I mentioned, all of our high schools in linked learning have created a similar outline of what do we want graduates to leave our school with. And I think these students would be prepared for the 21st century. Um, Tulare County Office of Education here, we're really, um, really quite proud of our student events and as we've had student events before the standards with our new standards we've looked to uh, rework them to increase the rigor we've added some events all in efforts to align to our new standards and really make sure that this is what learning looks like when it happens all of these pictures are from our student events in the last two to three months, and you can really see how um, students are applying their learning in this top picture. Those are students at the Math Super Bowl working collaboratively on a real world task to package smoothie bottles into uh, containers and then pack them on a truck. A great application for um, where we live in the Central Valley, but also very engaging and mathematically appropriate for their grade level. Also, um, Young Authors Fair now includes digital books for students so that we're really taking our events to the next level with um, our 21st century skills, technology, and new standards. One thing that people sometimes ask about and one of the fears with Common Core is that we have less choice than previously. And the truth is we actually have more choice. Now that our states adopted the standards, we have a choice in how we implement them. And we also have more choices regarding funding. So our districts now work under the LCAP, and so their local control means that more control for how school districts spend their money is now at the local level rather than the state level. 
So this is a really nice to see that choice and local control is a priority within our state. Okay, you have to laugh about this picture, right? You look at it and you see some cell phones there. Do you recognize a few that you may have had? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> and this is from a cell phone museum, but I think it's a nice way to kind of say there are a lot of changes and there are a lot of choices, but this is time for us to embrace the change. And as we consider, would you uh, go to a physician or acquire the services of a lawyer still using this phone? <laughs> why not? Well, why would we expect any different from educators? We really want our educators to be at the forefront of technology and change, and I really feel like we've done that as a county office. Many other um, areas throughout the state and across the nation have looked to the work that we do because we really have embraced the change to move forward, really hoping to support our schools and teachers for the students. That's why we're all here. So looking at our mission statement, I'd like you to find any words that resonate with you and share those out loud. Quality. Quality. Lifelong learning. Lifelong learning. Opportunities. Opportunities. Productive lives. Productive lives. This is why we all exist in our organization, is to help make those um, ideas that you just shared become a reality. And as we look at this last sentence, this was our mission statement before the new standards. This is our mission, but everything we've talked today about really um, is supported by our dedication to working in a collaborative manner with students, parents, school districts, public agencies, and communities to prepare students to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Isn't that exciting? We're all going in that direction and all of our efforts are supporting that work for all of our students. So this is just a picture of our website, the Common Core Connect website, where we're dedicated to um, supporting teachers and schools with the information and resources they need. And on your postcard, um, it will help you get there. And also, all the resources from today's presentation are on um, our Common Core Connect website for you to access. So we want you to make sure to take that. I'm going to have you as a debrief to wrap up our session, and then I'm going to show you one thing on Common Core Connect. I'm going to ask you to talk um, with the people around you. What is something you've learned today at our TCOE Common Core <coughs> Overview that you will share with others? Because Mr. Vidak really charged us with not only learning about the Common Core State Standards, but having that next step. So we're going to leave here. What is it that you would share with someone else? Right? Please talk in your small group. You may have noticed that I put Common Core Connect up here. This is the website I've referenced several times. We have our Tulare County Office of Education website, and then we also have this resource website dedicated to the work we're doing to support teachers and districts. Um, before I show you one thing on there, you might notice some things flying by and the tabs. Uh, if you want to find today's presentation, it's on the community tab. A question was asked about if you want to find the SBAC practice test, you could Google SBAC practice test. Or you could come to our website and click on our SBAC tab, and there's a link to the practice test there. Um, so before we wrap up, and I'll show you one, re uh, one search, because you can search in this search bar at the top to help teachers find uh, vetted resources that we're saying are quality. If you search there, it won't go to Google. It's an internal search, and it'll pull up only things that we've recommended. So I'll show you one search like that in a second. However, I'd like to hear what is something you plan on sharing with someone else? Just for maybe two or three people. I learned about the LCAP. I didn't know that the funding was going to be at a local level now. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of that because then we can target what our individual schools' needs are mm -hmm. rather than having Big Brother say, this is what you need. And that's great because some people think you used to get textbook money and it had to be spent on textbooks and if you didn't spend it on textbooks, you lost that money. Now you don't get textbook money, you get money and it goes into your different categories and so you might buy a textbook or you might choose not to. So that's a really good point. Good. All right, another sharing. I think the biggest thing that I'm going to hear after SBAC testing scores come out is if this new system is so great, why is my kid not doing as well? 
So I'm going to share the part about you can't compare apples to oranges, that this is completely different. And just because they scored this this year doesn't mean that they're going to score the same next year, and you have to give it a chance to work. You can't base it off of one school year. It has to be a collaborative over the course of their entire school year, years, not just one. So. I appreciate that because I do think people's confidence in their children, teachers, schools may waver, and really it's not worth wavering about. We need to recognize that it's all new. This is a new starting point, right? We're running a marathon. Education is not a sprint. This is a long-term commitment to our kids. We're not gonna run the marathon on the first day out there. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, any other ideas you'd like to share? I really like the visual you gave about the restructuring of the math with the Legos and the building blocks. Mm -hmm. And then the visual on the ELAs with the slinky, just mm -hmm. just to kind of help understand the difference between the two and the changes that are being made. Yeah, I really like that too because oftentimes people want both standards to work the same way, but we actually learn the content very differently, and that explains why they're structured differently. Thank you. All right, I heard a couple people earlier ask about um, support for parents, and that strategy came up specifically. So last year while working with Migrant, we developed this document. So I'll show you in the search, it's addition and subtraction strategies. And then if I click enter, there are lots of things that come up, but it's this one specifically labeled addition and subtraction strategies. And I actually shared this with a friend of mine who was struggling to support her two boys at home. And she actually took it to parent conferences and said, look at this great tool that I got from TCOB to help my students my kids. And what it does is it explains the name of the strategy, what the strategy is, and an example of the strategy, as well as standards that it might uh, be seen within. So for instance, what she was struggling with in particular was a new tool called a tape diagram, also known as a bar model. They're all over her kids' new adopted textbook, but the kids didn't know what they were and she didn't know what they were. So we talked about them and I gave her this resource and a few weeks later she texted me to say they were successful with tape diagrams and they had recently solved a very hard problem using this new strategy. So I think we're in the beginning stages of how do we support our parents in these changes also. Um, now that teachers are more comfortable with the changes, they can communicate it and I think we can um, also support these efforts. So this is just one example of the tools that we offer on Common Core Connect to support teachers. And I hadn't made it for parents, but it's really nice that it was supporting um, some parents that I know as well. I want to thank you all for your time uh, this morning. And just thank you for being here. Thank you for learning with us. And I hope that you um, feel supported and are proud of the work we're doing at our organization, TCOE, and you can continue to share what you've learned with others. So thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Hello, I'm Charlene Stringham, Assistant Superintendent of Instructional Services here at the Tulare County Office of Education in Visalia, California. Thank you for watching one of our Rising to the Challenge information sessions on the California Standards. Jim Vidak, our County Superintendent, designed this series so that all employees would have a better understanding of how the standards were created, why they were necessary, and what our office is doing to support their implementation in schools throughout the region. To date, we have offered 64 sessions, which have been attended by nearly 700 employees. The response to these information sessions has been overwhelmingly positive. Staff members have reported that they have developed a greater understanding of how their roles contribute to this important work. In addition, they have also shared that they feel more prepared to respond to questions and comments regarding the changing landscape of education. We appreciate State Superintendent Tom Torlakson for sharing this video through the California Department of Education. If you would like more information on how we develop this employee information series, please feel free to contact me. Thanks again for watching.